where you are joining from in the meantime so uh, we can see a little bit you know where from which places in the world you're you're joining okay vienna berlin zurich washington madrid leiden chicago okay so good group and i don't know if i told you alex i my peeps are from switzerland originally <laughs> Great. So you, yes. you, <laughs> I understand Swiss time. They left to the U.S. in the late 1600s. Wow. Okay. All the way back. Wow. Yeah. And then, then went to Canada in the late 1700s. But I'm Swiss by, uh, by origin. Okay. Okay. So you're a good tennis player, like Roger Federer. Like it all is all in our genes, right? <laughs> I wish. I wish. <laughs> Okay, people let's get people it. don't seem, seem to think I float around the tennis court elegantly, uh, Alex. But I did read just before we get started, right? Um, you had some influence on the Canadian Tennis Association, right? Absolutely. I was, I was chair of Tennis Canada for three years, on the board for 12 years, and was the architect with really three other people of the strategy that's turned us into a leading tennis nation. So that's, awesome. that, that, is, that is awesome. It is cool. It's cool I'm to watch. Sure. I'm sure not that many people yes. know it. Yeah, let's let's get started. So we're about a minute in. I think uh, uh, so a couple more people will trickle in. We have people up from Mexico, Amsterdam. Any peeps from Africa? I was speaking at the Africa Business Day today, so I'm curious. Anybody? Oh, Dubai. Cool. Okay, good. Okay, so we have a wonderful, wonderful guest today in our strat chat. Roger Martin, who I'd admired for a very long time, <laughs> read the books and really was an inspiration for Yves Pinier and myself for the work that we've done. Um, long, I, I won't go too much in, into the bio, right? But you have originally consulting background, been in academia, really leading thinker, been at the top of the thinkers 50 list and on many company boards. So really seeing it also from the inside, what companies are doing. And as we've just heard, you know, even turned around associations like uh, Tennis Canada. Roger, welcome to our show today. Oh, th thank you so much for having me, Alex. Any, any excuse to spend an hour with you is, is a good excuse as far as I'm concerned. I, I feel, I, I always feel so good after talking to you. I learn every time and you're such a nice person at the same time. So we're here today because uh, Roger launched his new book, When More Is Not Better. And we'll go deep into that. But just to get started, what allows us kind of to sponsor these strat chats are the uh, online courses we do, the uh, webinar, uh, Invincible Company. So take a screenshot, Gab who made this all possible, the webinar today, we'll also share it in the chat window. And we have a second one together with David Bland about testing business ideas to decrease the risk of your um, ideas so you don't waste a lot of you know, venture capital money and don't waste a lot of your time. And with that, we'll start with a very, very quick poll. And let me see if I can elegantly switch the screen. So you can use your mobile phone, you'll use it to tweet and the awesome stuff that uh, Roger and I are going to talk about. But you can also use it now just to go to the poll uh, there, and we will switch, see how elegantly or not so elegantly I can do that. Let's go over here and maybe launch. Oh, we already have people here joining our poll. So who's been to a, a strategizer webinar already? So I'm doing this because afterwards we're going to ask you a couple of questions. So this is kind of the warm up. So a couple of you have been to most, and we need more votes. We need more votes from the 250 people are here. Got to see, because afterwards we're going to get to real work, <laughs> talking about real substance. So at least a couple of you more, we got some, get, get some votes. On top, you go to menti.com, type into menti the code, and that will allow you to participate in our other, um, other polls that we will do. Okay. So quite of an even group, very shy, timid. We only got about 40 people pulling out their phones, pulling out their browsers to vote. Hope we'll get a little bit more afterwards. Okay, but at least you now know where to go when we launch you on a poll. Roger, tell us maybe first to get started, what motivated you to write this book and kind of, you know, what got you started? Because, you know, you tackle really big ideas and you always have a real reason to write a book. So I'm curious about this one, a little bit behind the scenes. What drove yeah. you to write, to start this book? 
Sure. So we have to go back to 2013, which is when I, I started the project that resulted in the book. And at that time, I was worried about what I saw as, as this, this stagnation that, of middle incomes in the U.S. So the, the book studies the U.S., although I think it is broader app, app, applicability. But I was looking at U.S. median income, and it had historically gone up kind of smartly in almost all years, right? There'd be the odd recession, but by and large, it was advancing. In fact, ever since they started measuring it up to uh, uh, 1976, it was growing at 2.4% per year compound annual. What's meaningful about that is that means it doubles every 30 years. So, so essentially, the American economy for that median family, that average family right in the middle of the distribution could look forward to their children having twice the level of real income that, that they had. Pretty good, right? Makes for a good system. That after 1976, which I pick, you could pick any year in the mid 70s. I just picked the bicentenary year. After that, <laughs> it had flattened out, <clears throat> flattened out dramatically. Uh, in fact, 0.6 of 1%, so a quarter, a quarter of the rate, which meant that the <clears throat> that median family who previously had doubled their income in one generation took a hundred years uh, to do so, right? So that that was the motivating factor. I said, what happens in a democratic capitalist country when the the swing voter, because I sort of, I sort of said, hey, you know, in, in some sense, the median family is the swing voter. I mean, it's not actually them, but it's it's in that band. If that, if the swing voter says this isn't really working for me, what would happen uh, to democratic uh, capitalism? Uh, and so that motivated me uh, to study it. And interesting enough, between two thousand and thirteen and now. A bunch of the things that I worried about have have kind of kind of happened, right? There's more there's more uh, kind of ambivalence about capitalism, right? Young uh, 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 voters, uh, when polled, say, ah, you know, social maybe socialism uh, uh, in, instead. So so I I kind of love the combination of democracy and capitalism, and so I wanted to study why why had things changed. And could we could we get it to change back to this world of of this ever advancing prosperity of average Americans? And before we get to some of the solutions, how we actually can get there, let's dive a little bit into the challenge there, in, into the problem. Like, why actually did that happen? Like, did anything go wrong, or was this just kind of going the trajectory, and somehow we got we we got off the road? What are some of the challenges that led us to where we are today before we kind of get into, you know, how can we get out of this? Sure. So it, it, it's a little bit different story than, than kind of lurching off the road or something. It's, it's, almost, it's almost as, 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 as though we sped up too much uh, and then slowed down, I guess. It's, it's that we pushed something too hard and so hard that we made something that was a good thing no longer a good thing. It's just like, as I say, more ice cream is generally a good thing, unless you end up eating ice cream all day long, in which case it turns out to be a bad thing. That, that is exact, exactly what's happened. So uh, um, uh, America, like many other countries, but America I think of as the lead in, in, in this and not lead in a good way, it's sort of farthest along a problematic path but embrace the idea that we must make the economy more run more efficiently. Like it all goes back to 1776, Adam Smith, the wealth of nations, pin factory. You know, it's, it's more efficient, said Adam Smith, not to have uh, each individual, Alex makes an entire pin, Roger makes an entire uh, uh, a pin, uh, rather, you have uh, some people making the stem, some people making the head, some people putting it together, division of labor, that'll make you more efficient. And David Ricardo came along 41 years later and said, you should trade comparative advantage. Portuguese should uh, grow grapes, make wine and trade it with the, <clears throat> the UK that should raise sheep and make wool because they've got the natural conditions, uh, climactic conditions that make it more uh, uh, better for them to do the one thing and trade. And then 
Frederick Grinzel Taylor, scientific management. If you're analyzing scientifically, you can be more efficient. Edwards Deming, uh, total quality, you can, you can uh, 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 get waste out of the system and improve quality. There was this push for ever more efficiency. And that did power lots of productivity gains that were behind that increase in, in income. But by 1976, we had pushed so hard to say, we're gonna open trade, we're gonna deregulate, we're gonna offshore jobs, we're gonna let companies merge to be more efficient, we're gonna get capital markets to be to merge so that the bid-ask spreads are, are lower. Uh, we came with a cult of we need to reduce labor uh, costs so that we can be more efficient. We pushed efficiency to such a point, to such a point, that we started getting results that we didn't expect. We thought it's a machine, just make the various pieces of it more efficient, add them up and we'll add up to something better. That stopped happening. And help me make the link and I'll be a bit provocative here. Like, yeah, yeah efficiency is good, right? More productivity. Help me make the link where something got decoupled, right? That how was that, that productivity gain, maybe even more, you know, income for, for people, where did that go off the rails? Like, why didn't that, why doesn't that connect anymore with the income of a majority of people? Where did that gap open up? How did that piece happen, right? I, I, to to sure. help our listeners kind of follow that one thing happened, which was a good thing. And then all of a sudden this decoupled with income, right? So where, where did, where did we get off the road there? Or again, well, maybe we didn't get off the road, but we somehow missed the sign somewhere. Yes, yes, we missed we missed the slow down sign. Uh, um, so it's I'll give you two different kinds of answers. One, where how is it manifested? It's manifested in a delinking of productivity and wages. So up till 1976, uh, uh, actually 73, 74, uh, uh, to be more precise, the correlation between productivity increase, so think of productivity and efficiency, where we got more efficient, more productive, and wage growth was almost one-to-one. -one. Literally, you as a worker should have been incredibly enthusiastic about any effort to increase productivity because it would go right into your pocket. Uh, it's, it, it completely changed. Productivity kept going up and wages stagnated almost entirely. So that was the, the manifestation of it. Why did that happen? Well, it, it turns out that, that what we know from complexity theory is if you take a system that is a, is a Pareto is a is a normally distributed system where the where the elements of the system are independent one from another, and increasingly put pressure on it, you will turn it into a different kind of distribution. It sort of naturally turns into a different kind of distribution. And complexity theorists, for what it's worth, often use a sand pile to uh, illustrate this. So if you keep dropping uh, uh, sand grains on a, on, a, on a pile, they keep landing on the pile and the pile actually looks, looks uh, 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 like a bell curve in shape. Think of a sand pile. It looks like sort of a, a, a bell curve. And then suddenly you drop one, uh, uh, one more grain of sand and the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the curve, the curve uh, 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 turns out to, turns out to uh, or the sand pile collapses completely, and that's called a that's called a Pareto distribution. Excuse me for a second. I, I just have to, I have to stop something that I didn't know was going to go on to from going on. That that's the pandemic uh, that happens to us all the time. I had actually a bad technology day today, right? So something happens all the time, which is yes. okay. <laughs> We're used to it by now, right? Yeah, Maybe yeah. over there got to be a little quiet. <laughs> Absolutely. So so what what happens is is uh, is that it that it turns Pareto. So uh, so the the thinking the uh, the the way to think about it is the only reason that the sand pile collapses is because of gravity, right? If the, the, if the dropping sand would drop in no gravity, you would, you would, never, you would never, have that, uh, never have that change, 
right? Uh, and in, and instead, and instead, you uh, uh, because because it hits the the pile hard enough. So the more gravity you you have, the harder the sand uh, the sand hits, and, and the more likely that pressure is is going to create this this different dis, uh, distribution. Also, the other factor that, that fits in is, is decreasing cost of connection. So if you have a system where each pebble of sand is at its own little superstructure, the sand pile will never collapse. But because they're connected to one another, the, the sand pile collapses. So pressure and connection actually turns distributions where where you have a more normal distribution. So think about, think about incomes. Incomes are normally uh, uh, distributed. You apply more and more pressure to that. You decrease the cost of connection and it turns, it, and turns into a Pareto uh, distribution. Um, and that's what's happened in the US economy. So incomes are turning out to, to be more Pareto uh, distributed, the rich, in the in the long tail, the few rich in the long tail, that tail is extending out more and more. The middle class is is uh, is reducing, uh, and so that's that's the that's what's what's changed is we got to a point where we, in some sense, made the sand pile the sand pile collapse, uh, and and the problem with it is when that happens, there is no sort of balancing mechanism. Right. So in, 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 a, in a normal kind of distribution, right, or you've got a normal distribution, we have something called the central limit theorem, right, that says the more uh, data points you add, the more it looks the same. Uh, not so in these Pareto distributions. Uh, and in a Pareto distribution, the way to think about it, the, meta, the metaphor for it is, is that when effects become the cause of more of the effect still that you, the, uh, you get these Pareto distributions. So think Instagram, right? The median Instagram user has got, has uh, between 100 and 150 followers, right? The number one Instagram uh, uh, person on Instagram last time I checked was Cristiano Ronaldo, the uh, football player. Uh, with 216 last time, 216 million last time I checked. So when you go to Instagram to figure out who you're going to follow, what what do you look at? How many followers do they have? So the effect having followers is the cause of still more of that effect, and that and that uh, uh, then causes Cristiano Ronaldo to get kind of more followers and more followers and more followers. That's that's what's happening. Because we have we have pressurized the economic system, effects are having more are being the cause of more of the uh, the effect. We all know this when 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 you're asked, well, how you know how do you make money? It's to have money, right? That's a, that's an example uh, example of it. Uh, and so things the the economy is going more uh, more Pareto, uh, and and we've just pushed efficiency too far. Yeah, one of the things I want to get back to a little bit to efficiency and leadership also, right? You've been working a lot with leaders in, in, in established companies, great successful companies. And there's this focus on managing what they have and getting better and better at it, right? And getting more and more efficient at it. So, and, and what are some of that things, you know, because we both talk about innovation. That's actually the enemy of innovation, right? This pure yeah, focus yeah. Of, of, of efficiency. What led to that? So what, you know, these are smart people managing these companies. What led to this drive to efficiency to a point where we actually didn't see the slowdown sign and didn't realize that more efficiency is actually going to have a very negative impact over the longer term? What happened there? Well, I, I think it was, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. I just, I guess my, my theory on it, again, from, from during this whole period being consulting closely to the senior executives, what what I've observed is is that is there's been an ever more sort of reductionist kind of if you will faux scientific <laughs> approach to business and we're in the middle of it right now everything is data analytics big data etc. It it's sort of the the approach has been let's break things down into narrower and narrower pieces so that we can manage each piece 
with sort of ever more scientific precision. Um, and not to worry, we can add it all back up you know, in, 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 in the end to the, to the, to the whole. And so, so that, that is just sort of, when you do that, when you narrow it down, you are more inclined to think I can make it perfect. So, and you give, you hand off tasks, you say, you're in charge of labor costs, Alex, you know, labor costs, they're the enemy, we've got to get them, there are bigger variable costs, Alex, your job is to get those down. And then you go over to whatever, Bill or Sally or something and say, your job is to make sure customers are really satisfied. Now you go perfect that and Alex, you go perfect, uh, be perfect uh, kind of labor costs. And, and you go and say, okay, lowest possible labor. Cost. Well, that's easy. You know, let's, let's, uh, you know, let's bust the union or let's create a two tier wage structure where we pay number ones. And you're assiduously working away on, on being maximally efficient, driving all slack out. Well, how many people do we need? Let's have the minimum number of people. Let's pay them in the minimum amount. And then poor Sally over there, who's trying to work on customer service, can't get the workers to deliver the kind of service she needs right? But she's busily trying to perfect something as uh, something too and saying, well, how could we be more efficient with our customer uh, service? Well, let's spend less time with each customer and make sure we're just doing the bare, bare minimum. And then when you add it up, you, you find out, wow, uh, you know, we may be efficient according to Sally and efficient according to Alex, but you uh, kind know, of, Customers aren't showing up anymore, and and it doesn't matter how quote efficient you are if you have no customers. That's that's the kind of uh, thing that I that I see going on. So it's kind of inadvertent being drawn in through this narrow sort of perfectionism. We're narrow, and we're going to perfect it to pushing pushing that narrow efficiency and thinking that that's going to be uh, good for you. So Roger and I prepared a couple of questions that we want you to think of and about in your business context. So one, please type into the chat window if you can think of one way your business, your business is unhelpfully reductionist. Then let's see if anything comes up. So starting to see maybe some coming up. Siloed goals, um, Chris is talking yep. about. Yeah. Not unheard of, right? In Not many organizations. Of, yeah. Yeah, in this case, Sally and Alex had siloed goals that contributed to your the behavior pattern. Lack of innovation mindset. Do you see yeah. that? Would that be an? Yeah, absolutely. Because innovation, innovation is. I mean, you and I love innovation, but it's inefficient, right? You 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 don't know when it's going to come, at what pace, etc. Et uh, uh, and you have to, and you have to sort of hang in there, and in some sense, waste time. Uh, that ends up being incredibly uh, uh, valuable, but it doesn't feel efficient at the time. Yep. No some collaboration. Yeah. yeah, exactly. People are encouraged in some sense. You have this piece, you optimize that, you have that piece. Then their boss says, and why don't you work together? But there's no, there's actually no kind of way of doing that, incentives to do it, et cetera. Yeah, so personal interest. Here's one, here's one that I think you're, you, you have something to say about. Too much power to shareholders versus other stakeholders. Uh, absolutely. I, I, although it's interesting, I think people, people assume shareholders want things that they don't really want, right? Like actually, actually, you know, most shareholders, like let's take the U.S. market. Most, the, almost half of, of U.S. owners of U.S. equities are retirement investors. They're either a pension fund, that is de facto a, a retirement investor, or they are holders of IRAs, individual retirement accounts. Are they actually interested in this quarter's uh, uh, earnings? Yeah. They're, just, they're just demonstrably not actually. Now there are these other intermediaries, analysts and whatever, who, who, who scream and shout about it, but they're interested in what the, what the company is going to be doing 50 years, or not 50, but maybe 20 or 30, 30 years from now. But we assume that they're incredibly interested in, in this quarter and then start behaving in, in that fashion. And as your, as your chat person said, sort of obsessing about, uh, about that when 
I, I believe more in, in uh, this sort of comes all the way from Aristotle, right? Aristotle said way back 2,500 years ago or 2,400 years ago, uh, that if a person sets out in life to be happy, they won't necessarily end up happy. They're unlikely to end up happy instead. If instead they, uh, they set out to uh, leave a, live a good life by which he meant a life of like servitude to others in your society, they're likely to end up happy. So often companies think that pursuing shareholder value will maximize shareholder value. It doesn't. Saying you're, you're going to do that, what, what, what do you think you know, is correlated with, with, uh, with shareholder value, Alex? Absolutely. Things like business model innovation, uh, things, things like serving your customers and caring about your customers. It's an end product of, of, of that. So I, I think the chat person is, 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 whose name I now forget is, is correct that we, that we are obsessing about a narrow, a narrow metric, today's shareholder value. Uh, and that is not at all helpful, uh, even to the cause of increasing shareholder val value. And as I say in the book, uh, what, what I advocate for executives is pursue multiple, often internally conflictual uh, metrics, because that's what's going to make you think harder and be more clever about how you operate. Yeah. Now, you have a couple of examples of companies that, you know, have overcome unhelpful reductionism. So I'm curious to hear some of them. And you know what, maybe what our, our listeners or participants can learn from that. Because they're really, really beautiful examples in the book. So I invite everybody already, if you're here, you've got to go buy the book, but we'll already get a little bit of a teaser. It's really good stuff. Perfect. Yeah, so, uh, so I'll, I'll give a simple example and then, uh, then, then may, maybe a, 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 a longer one. The simple example on metrics is Southwest Airlines, right? The most successful airline in the US by far, and the only one that's earned its cost of capital over the last 50 years, so shareholder, shareholder uh, uh, value there, has the following four goals and, and that they measure themselves rigorously on. We want to be the lowest cost airline in America, the highest employee satisfaction airline, the uh, highest customer satisfaction airline, and the most profitable airline. And you could say, wow, that's crazy. Those people are nuts. How can you be the lowest cost and highest employee satisfaction? you got to keep wage costs way down and manage that really tightly and so employees are not going to particularly like that but you know tough tough because we want to be lowest cost and most profitable but instead when you have that set of goals you have to get really clever right so you can't just uh get low cost on the backs of paying your employees badly treating them badly etc uh, because then they won't be highest employee satisfaction. So how do you do it? Well, you create a completely different business system that says we're not going to have interline bag checking. We're not going to have uh, advanced uh, uh, seat selection. We're going to have flexible labor force that can work on a lot of things. We're going to have only one kind of uh, uh, aircraft to make gates uh, uh, simp uh, simpler, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these things that result in you needing fewer employees per passenger seat mile so you can pay them more than they'd make anywhere else in the in the indus industry and you're still the low cost in passenger first passenger seat mile and your employees love you love you all the crazy so that's an that's an example of the opposite of reductionism saying all these things these things uh, uh link together uh but, you know, another example that I go into in more detail is Joe's Stone Crab, a, a, a restaurant in Miami, uh, Miami Beach that I recommend to everybody here on the on the call. It's fab fabulous uh, place. But there, there, the family that that has own, owned it, it's the number one grossing uh, independent restaurant, single restaurant in in uh, America. Uh, and there, right, they understand that they need to pay more, so they pay more. Uh, because they understand that they need an atmosphere where you've got long-term employees. In that industry, turnover is around 70%, right? So anybody that you see in a restaurant is on their way to a 16-month career there. Their, their employees stay on, on average 10 years. Uh, 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 and, and so they need to pay more 
uh, to, to get that. They've got to treat them better. They do all sorts of things that would be viewed as, uh, as inefficient. They pay the highest rates for stone crabs because as the, as the current uh, generation owner says, we want the children of our stone crab fishermen to think that stone crab fishing is a great occupation because it pays well and pays well enough to put their kids through college, et cetera, et cetera, because that's what we're interested for the, for the long haul. So, the, and, and they, have, they have one entree. Stone crabs are an expensive entree. They have half chicken uh, on, entree for $6.99. That's been at $6.99, $6.99 for, for the longest time, in part because Joanne Bass, the third generation uh, kind of owner, the mother of the owner now refuses to let it uh, be uh, increased. And she says, the accountants come to her and say, Joanne, Miss Bass, you know, we're losing money on every order. And she says, that's what they think. But if we didn't have that on it, a whole bunch of people wouldn't come. We'd lose, we'd lose the flavor of the place, which is an open, inclusive uh, place. It wouldn't really be Joe Stone Crabs. And, and uh, we'd stop selling a whole bunch of our, our expensive uh, stone crab uh, kind of uh, entrees. So they think it loses us money, but I know it doesn't. So it ain't going anywhere and it ain't, and it, and it ain't going uh, uh, up. That is sort of, if you will, anti-reductionist. It's holistic thinking that says this thing that you might not imagine uh, connects to that thing uh, and that thing connects to, to, uh, to that thing. And what do you end up with, with? You end up with literally the number one grossing restaurant in, in America. And it's kind of interesting too, because, because it's, it's, uh, uh, it closes uh, when, when you're out of the stone crab season. Right, so it actually it's the number one grossing uh, restaurant operating at at now nine months a year. Right, yeah. that's that's amazing. Let let us actually get everybody to participate a bit here and see who else can come up with uh, companies that turn their back on reductionism. A couple were asking which airline was that? That was Southwest Airlines. Which yeah. restaurant it was Joe's Stone Crab in? You said Miami, right? Miami Beach. Yep. Miami Beach. Okay. So let's see. Patagonia, of course. Patagonia is a great example. What a crazy, crazy nutty idea that that uh, telling people not to buy a new Patagonia jacket, send their existing one in, and we'll fix it. How yeah. stupid is that? Well, it's only it only has made them one of the most successful companies in their uh, in their industry on the planet. Uh, you know, so so some of these things make no sense narrowly, but when you look at it broadly. It makes it makes the 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 world the world of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And and while people are inputting this, so please everybody think a little bit and go to uh, menti.com, enter the code, participate. You got to think hard, right? But while we're leaving that up, uh, Roger, this connects to strategy thinking, right? And I remember we had a conversation, right, <laughs> which I found very refreshing, but also thought provoking, where you were saying, "Look, Alex, most companies." They don't actually do strategy. So this is clearly a connection to differentiation, new business models, real strategy. So when you say most companies don't do strategy in this context that we're discussing, yeah. what do you mean? Well, what, what, I, what I mean when I say that is, is uh, most people think of strategy as planning. Uh, and I'm all, I mean, I'm all for planning. You should have a, you should have a plan. You should have a, you know, a budget. Uh, but, but for most people, strategy is a budget with pros. So it just explains, explains all the, you know, the cost items and the, and, the, and the revenue items. Strategy is the act of making choices to do some things and not other things, right? Um, and, uh, and doing that so that you find, figure out a place that you're gonna play and a way that you're gonna win uh, uh, there. And if and it's only it's only companies that make choices like that 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 end up being on on, on diagrams uh, uh, like this that they're they're the exemplary players and and I just 
kind of rue the fact that strategies become this very technical exercise where it involves analyzing the hell out of everything, crunching all sorts of numbers, and then saying, here are the, here are the sort of the 10 initiatives we're going to take. And you look at them and say, but why, you know, for what reason, in, in what way is that, is that going to provide a wonderful kind of solution for some customer set that makes you better than anybody else? And you know, I, I have my own way of, of 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 doing that. You have a way of doing that, or they're very com they're very consistent and compa compatible because I think that's where the business business model canvas gets gets you to. It's a choice driving. Well, you can uh, you can confirm or not. I see it as a choice driving vehicle. It drives you to make choices, and and what we both I think try to do is is show people the implications of the choices they're making so so both your canvas my my cascade say well no but really if you did this could you do this as well well how would you have to do it so it all coheres to a pattern of, a of answers that produces something great we have a couple of interesting companies there but but instead of going a little bit deeper there's some that come up obviously apple and so i do want to make the connection to another theme that kind of in this context of strategy making and then measuring, <laughs> um, yes. you talk about surrogation, right? And I think it's a very important topic that we need to bring up in this in this context before we kind of look at, you know, what does this actually mean for 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 our world, for capitalism, and and the world we we view we have. I do think uh, we should touch on surrogation a little bit, um, you, and you describe that really well in the book. What do you mean with that? Yeah, it's it's an it's not my concept. It's a, uh, the the uh, the concept of a couple of of, uh, of scholars that 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 really really struck me. So the notion is when we have a metric for something that we want. So we want something, uh, and then in order to get it, we create a metric to measure our progress towards that. What we often forget is that the metric is just a metric. Uh, it's the best kind of way we can attempt to measure the thing we want, it becomes the thing. And so the classic current e example of, of that, uh, the uh, cautionary tale is Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo wants to have a very good thing, deep customer relationships because with a deep customer relationship, they'll stick around longer, we can serve them well, da, da, da. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. They use a metric, which is accounts per customer. So, and you can see accounts per customer isn't deep customer relationship, right? It's a facet of it, it's a measurement uh, of it. But Alex, you could have you know, 12 accounts open with a given bank that you don't particularly like uh, and you do most of your actual real financial services somewhere somewhere else, but you just leave your accounts open. So we know that number of accounts isn't equal to deep cu customer relationship. But if that's what you keep pounding, okay, we got to have more uh, more accounts per customer, more accounts per customer. People then surrogate it and say, well, that that is now implicitly they just say, well, that is deep customer uh, relationship. And so then. <laughs> chat GDP is is uh, another such metric. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, you know, GDP more GDP means a better economy. Not right, uh, uh, but uh, uh, but so what happens then is when you set up metrics, you then often set up incentive systems that are associated with those metrics, and you set up an incentive system and punishment system for for account uh, number of accounts per customer, and they start mailing Alex uh, a credit card that he never asked asked for, and a, opening a checking account that he never asked for, and then they get sued for ten billion, and their 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 uh, reputation is in tatters for for years, if not if not uh, decades. We'll see. So that, that's what I call, call part of the chain of imperfection between, between a desired outcome, a model, and, and uh, then the metrics uh, you use. So it's extremely dangerous. And, and what, I, what I would argue is that the danger increases when you focus on one metric. Because it's, it's just easier to say, if that's the only way we're going to measure the thing we want, 
it's very, very easy mentally for you to go from, from that to, oh, it is the thing. It is the thing that, uh, uh, that we want. Yep. And there's a couple of comments also right around uh, executive compensation and so, et cetera. But we, I, I'm, I am curious what people think who are here, you know, is this something that they see in their organization? So I just threw up another quick mentee, you know, yeah, how much do you point. agree with this question? Like in my company, proxy metrics are more important than creating value for customers and stakeholders, right? Where we have uh, one metric that kind of drives our organization, but they're decoupled from, you know, are we really creating value for customers and stakeholders? So kind of an interesting question. Um, yeah. And so any company, Alex, any company whose, whose CEO will stand up and say, our number one goal is increasing shareholder value is, is doing exactly, exactly this. You know, they're, they're saying that's, that's the metric for, for our performance as a company. And when you talk to leaders, you know, on the boards you are, the, the people you educate, you know, in talks, um, et cetera, um, what is kind of this reaction? Like, I'm, they're brilliant people, so they get it. But when we look at their actions, is, is this changing? Can we see some change over time where this is, you know, we're kind of back to really this, we say customer focus, but do we actually really measure customer value, et cetera? Do you see a, a shift happening? I, I do see some, Alex, and, I, and I'll give you an example. I, I was uh, on a board of a very big NYSE uh, uh, company, uh, or medium big, uh, 25 20, $25 billion uh, company. So decent, decent size NYSE traded company. And when I got on the board, I said, why on earth are we giving quarterly guidance? Like why, seriously, why? You know, you know walk me through how this is, how this works well. I just, just said, l l think of me as naive. Think, think of me you know, as a, a little old grandmother investor. And you're just explaining to me why this, why this is a good thing. And the answer was, well, Roger, it's just, you have to, everybody <laughs> does. And you, and you have to, uh, and I, and I said, I made the bold thing. That's would have been in 1999 or maybe 2000. I, I, I said, this is stupid, right? Uh, and and it's it's going to be fine because all it all it is is right. You're making a prediction about something that you actually can't predict. Uh, and then if you're falling short, you'll do things that are bad for the company to try and make up, uh, uh, you know, up for it. If you do get above it, you'll take your pedal, uh, your foot off the pedal. Uh, they'll get mad at you for making more actually than 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 your guidance because because. Uh, then they'll look silly as, a, as an analyst. Uh, so it's like all bad, it's all stupid, it's unsustainable, and it's going to go away. And they were like, oh, yeah, 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 you're a silly kind of, because by that time I'd become an academic, not a strategy consultant. So the minute I became an academic, I was called an academic, right? Like somehow I'd forgotten everything I knew before and was a quote academic. Um, uh, the academics, by the way, the entire time I was there said, well, you're a business guy. So it, you know, it was, it was a funny, <laughs> but, but funny experience. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I digress. Um, yeah. uh, but uh, I said, it's going to go away. It's only a matter of time. You can be at the end, end of the line or the start of the line. And sure enough, now guidance is no, no longer de rigueur. Yes, there's still a lot of it around. The guidance tends to be more general. It tends to be ranges uh, of, of, uh, of uh, top line uh, uh, growth, uh, wider ranges, et cetera. So, so it's slowly but surely going away as people understand that it's stupid. Giving guidance, let me be as crystal clear as possible, giving guidance is in all fashions ways stupid. And then it will be an extinct species in due course. It might take another 20 years to go as extinct as the dodo bird. So it's getting a little bit better. The business roundtable, as you probably know, Alex, uh, you know, a year, a year now, a bit ago, uh, issued this you know, statement saying we're not into shareholder value maximization, we're into stakeholders. I don't think they've done anything really uh, to back that up, but you know, that's that's a step in the right in, in the right direction. So I'm not, I'm uh, while while the problem is large, I am not, I'm not completely kind of morose about the <laughs> the possibilities of change. And if, if we look at the if we look at the data there, yeah, if I mean, we look at the 
if we look at the data there, it, it doesn't look too bad, right? I mean, it, it, it's kind of half half. So yeah. that's very encouraging that at least our participants, which we usually, you know, think are in the more kind of uh, in, innovative camp, maybe that's that's part of it. But then a lot of people in established companies um, trying to innovate, but kind of held back. But if we yeah. just one last thing, maybe on the longer term perspective, also not that quarterly view, um, Paul Pullman, who you know, and who I really admire for actually the first thing, you know, kind of saying, we're not going to do quarterly reporting because they took that long-term view. That's really hard to do. Now, what, what can leaders do to move towards that? So we, it's already our, our topic, right? We're trying to move towards yeah. solution a little bit, but just this particular case is such yeah. a driver, right? Well, see, I think what, what people don't understand about Paul, and yeah, Paul is a friend of mine. Paul always is so, is so sweet because he was a young P&G guy when I was consulting there. And so he tells people I taught him a strategy before he went to Nestle, good Swiss company, and then uh, Unilever. Um, it's it, anybody who thinks, you know, kind of basically all Paul Pullman did is say, I'm not going to do quarterly earnings is, you know, kind of is naive, right? So what Paul did was twin that with a campaign, a multi-year campaign to swap out his investor base. Right? So, so right, the, they are another kind of customers. Investors are another kind of customers. And you can have and nurture, in fact, CEOs who give detailed quarterly guidance and then try to, as hard as possible, including engaging in illegal activities, meet the, hit their, hit their, those, those numbers, attract investors who want quarterly guidance and want this stupid capital markets uh, dance, dance to go on. Paul Pullman said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna signal, no quarterly guidance, whatever, and then I'm gonna go around the world uh, and find investors who are really interested in us being long-term, where I can show our plans for R&D spending going up, branding spending going up, environmental sustainability uh, 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 going, uh, our participation in that uh, kind of going up. And those will be sovereign wealth funds, uh, long-term investors. And so over the course of the first few years there, he swapped out a bunch of short-term shareholders for long-term shareholders. Once again, what is this not an example of? <laughs> Reductionism, right? He said, I will link the market for investors with the Unilever operating market uh, and tie those together. And that's what you have to do. It's, it's, I, I could make an argument that Paul Pullman and Herb Kelleher are birds of a feather. They're more similar than different. They both said, I'm gonna to link together a bunch of things that people aren't linking together to come up with a clever, a more clever uh, uh, solution. And so, so it would be a mistake, I think, for another CEO to stand up and do what Paul Pullman did and think it'll work if that's all he or she does. It only worked because he thought about it in this systemic holistic way. And that, that's the, the real, I mean, Paul Pullman, you know, on his deathbed will be able to say, I made a real contribution to society. He's made a contribution and he made it what people think he did was 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 uh, you know redu uh, the, you know knock it off with this crazy guidance. But what he really did was create a system that made that sustainable. And how do I know it was sustainable? It's when three three G the Brazilian you know uh, uh, takeover uh, uh, company has failed once in a, in a major takeover effort once, uh, and that was with Unilever because in the other cases. When they go to the shareholders and say, listen, your management of the, your company now is doing a crummy job. If you side with us and our takeover, uh, we'll take this over, we'll take a majority stake and we will get this company working well. 3G went to the Unilever shareholders and said this, Paul Pullman, you know, he's not doing it. And the shareholders basically said, um, could you get out of my office, uh, <laughs> morons? Uh, and 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 it's it apparently stunned the hell out of 3G, and they just they just they just you know uh, bailed out of their offer within a within a, a matter a matter of weeks because all the shareholders weren't listening. Why? It's because Paul did the two things together, not just one. 
And that's, that's a prerequisite, this kind of long-term view to do any kind of really substantial innovation, right? Um, we, Gab just posted a, a blog post that we launched, I think yesterday, about how um, Paul Polman, you know, launched this sustainable living. And they couldn't have done it without this long-term view. The existing investors would have just not let it happen. So he had to change that investor base. And I yes. think we're seeing this, you know, a lot of CEOs I'm talking to are moving towards this understanding that they need to take this long-term view. Roger, time is running so fast. Maybe one, one last big thing that you'd say, you know, a lot of innovators here in the room, but yep. also entrepreneurs, you know, going back to when more is not better, you have a you know, whole section on solutions for different categories, right? You know, yes. academics, um, um, citizens, but let's stick to the business category for a second. Sure. What would be that one big tip, that one big thing you'd like innovators, leaders, and entrepreneurs who we have in the call today, what would you like them to take away to, to move towards a solution? Well, uh, one, would, one would be just, you know, kind of stick assiduously to fighting reductionism. And, and for, especially for your, your entrepreneurs, I mean, I think often when they go probably to get funding, they go to their bank to try to get funding, they're going to be told in some sense to be reductionist. Uh, what about this little thing? What about this little thing? And, and I would just say, stick to saying, to being able to explain how you see things fitting together, right? This fits together with that. That's why I'm doing this thing that appears very strange to you if you're taking a narrow financial uh, uh, analysis. And you just have to, you have to <clears throat> stick with that because the minute you retreat to reductionism, right? If you retreat to re reductionism in entrepreneurship and innovation, you are toast. There is no way back uh, uh, from that. You're down, you're down essentially uh, to, to a cul-de-sac. When you can pu pull things together, it opens up possibilities. So that, that, would, be, that would be number one. And, num and number two that's utterly consistent with that is this always have multiple uh, measures, right? Don't, don't give your investors, you know, measure us on this one thing uh, alone because you're just, you're, you're, it's going to get you in trouble and it's going to take you in a reductionist direction. So the, the, that would, that I think for, for your innovators and entrepreneurs, those would be the two things. There, there are some other things that I, that I would advise, advise if they're, if they're, uh, you know, a corporate executive. Uh, but but for 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 the people on I think on this call those would be the ones I would I would uh, I would uh, uh, say and and just don't like you know on on things like shouldn't you be minimizing your labor costs no why are you paying these people so much because it's smart not stupid right it it just you're just gonna have to hold your ground and and I know like I you know I'm I'm an entrepreneur too a bunch of us a bunch of us you know kind of bred and raised a a a, 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 a company that grew grew quite large I grew up at the feet of an entrepreneur so I'm not sort of saying this like I'm a I I just understand that I'm going to be really powerful because I'm a corporate executive type. No, I've been an entrepreneur and, and you just have to have to stick to those, uh, to those things. Yeah. And, and there was somebody, there was somebody actually that, there was somebody that mentioned, right. Do I, you know, do I, what about user metrics? Do I focus on that? Again, it's about strategy. You know, you take one metric. If you're in a, in a, in an uh, internet startup user users or user usage, that's, that's too limiting, right? But let's, let's actually go back to the executives because we do have a lot of executives on the call. Yep, some of yep. them leaders of business units, some of them leaders of innovation. So let's also take that angle. Like what, what's, what's one of the things that you would recommend? Of course, you know, similarities beyond reduc reductionism, but what would you specifically advise executives um, um, to do? Well, just recognize that slack is not the enemy we're we're in an environment now where where you are rewarded for identifying and eliminating slack so what tends to happen to the stock price of a nyse traded company or lse traded you know b or a tokyo stock exchange big company that announces a 10,000 person uh, uh reduction in staff typically stock goes up Right, right. Like literally, I mean, and 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 so so there is a culture of slack reduction. Now, 
do I think that we should get rid of kind of, you know, kind of completely redundant kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, workers? Sure. But you have to remember the person who we're in some sense following the advice of, we don't want him rolling over in his grave, and that's W. Edwards Deming, who showed how you got rid of waste in the system, but was super duper clear <laughs> that, that zero slack is never the right answer, right? Never the right answer. Like zero slack in PPE coming into COVID was not a good answer. Zero slack in number of emergency nurses was not the right answer. There's a, a, a proper amount of slack. So for these executives who are in this pressurized environment that says you've got to keep trimming everything down and zero is the right, is the right answer. Zero is not the right answer. The right answer is some number above zero and, it, and slack is not the enemy. Uh, you know, Costco, talk about it in the book, Costco knows exactly how many people the staffing algorithm uh, would say should be on the, uh, the store floor uh, at, at, uh, uh, at any given time, given the likely number of people in it. And they just take that number and, and add something to it. They just add something to it. Why? It's because they want it to be, they want it to be uh, to, for customers to have an awesome uh, uh, experience and they get the sales per square foot and the profit per square foot off the charts because they embrace productive slack. Now, people are asking, um, where can they find more? You know, some people want to go a little bit deeper and listen maybe to some of your other talks. So where can they find more uh, about your work beyond the book, uh, your latest book, when, when more sure. is not better? So, uh, so here's what they should do. I, I, have, a, I have a website, which is www.rogerlmartin. My initial, <laughs> my middle initial is L. So uh, like on the book cover. So remember, put that in the code. And, and, and what you'll see is the ability to click on the book. And then the, uh, the, that page shows reviews of it, uh, video, audio, podcast. There's already probably you know, there, there's 15 or 20 reviews that go into the book and, and probably 20 either audio or video uh, 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 podcasts like this. So, and you can just sort of, you know, uh, navigate through them and see what, what uh, strikes your fancy. And I'm trying to keep it updated every, every uh, week or so, but there would be plenty on there for, for people who want to dig uh, deeper into it. Awesome. In one sentence, I'll, I'll give you the most provocative question that you can never answer in a sentence. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel? Are you positive about capitalism in particular? Talk about a lot in the book about American capitalism. Positive, negative. One sentence. I, I, I'm I'm positive. I, as you know me, Alex, I, I am uh, the eternal optimist. Here's here's what I believe. I I I, I believe in the tipping point of models. Right, so, so once you adopt a model of some sort and people adopt it generally, that, that, that ends up producing enormous amounts of activity consistent with that, that uh, model. So if you're on a bad model, <laughs> you can get enormous leverage by shifting, the, shifting that model. It's not just like you'll turn a little bit, a little bit, it's the tipping point, uh, the Malcolm Gladwell way back when tipping point. So I believe if we can just achieve this tipping point of switching from the reductionist machine model to the, the, the holistic complex adaptive system model where we're tending uh, you know, the Amazon, not thinking about Amazon Inc. Um, we could have a, a, an inflection point and a dramatic increase in in the the performance of democratic capitalism so that's a longer answer but the short answer is i i am optimistic if we can just get a model change and that sounds like a good end we have a lot of work to do a lot of innovators in the room a lot of leaders so a lot of work to do thank you roger as usual you know one hour just flies so i appreciate very much that you took the time thank you very much for being with us today it was absolutely my pleasure, Alex. It's, as I say, an, ex an, an excuse to spend an hour with you is always a good excuse. Excellent. Thank you, Gab, also for setting this up. Gab from our, from our team behind the scenes, putting this all together. Of course, thank you to everybody who joined today. And again, if you want to uh, read more, uh, hear more about Roger, you go get the book, that's for sure, and go to the website 
rogerlmartin.com. Thank you, everybody, and have a great evening, morning, wherever you are. We have people joining sometimes at 3 in the morning. So <laughs> have a good one. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care.